Let's pray together. God, thank you so much that you indeed so love the world that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, that no one would perish but have eternal life through him. Lord, as we look at this passage today, as we consider the miracle of the resurrection on this Easter Sunday, I pray, Father, that many would be strengthened in their faith in you. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the point of any good movie is to construct characters in which the viewer can see him or herself in some perspective, some way. We call this character identification. Character identification is the tendency to experience part of a character's achievements, failures, foibles, likes and dislikes, as if they were our own. It doesn't mean you necessarily like the character, but science tells us, the brain researchers tell us, that it's very, very common for a person to identify with characters in a story, in a movie. So, when you watch Star Wars, when you watch Harry Potter, name a movie that you like, The Count of Monte Cristo, Back to the Future, Gone with the Wind, any of these movies, you see these characters and somehow you see yourself in them. It's one of the reasons we enjoy going to the theater and we look forward to the theaters being open once again. I know for me personally, I like to think that I identify with Clark Kent, Superman. Yeah, that's how I like to picture myself. Unfortunately, my family tells me that I'm like another Clark, Clark Griswold. So maybe I should identify with him. No, we, we find ourselves in the story. We identify with characters. And so we grow attached to characters. I mean, just now when I was showing those pictures to you of different movie characters, iconic movie characters, you probably got excited when you saw one or two of those pop on the screen. You're attached to them in a certain way. We cry over movie characters. I mean, sometimes when you see a movie, you might end up acting like the movie character for a few days after you view the film. This is the way it works, character identification. Well, the Bible is full of characters whose triumphs of faith and struggles with sin we can absolutely identify with. We're going to look today at a passage on this Easter Sunday from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And as we look at this passage, I want to encourage everyone to see yourself in the story, to find yourself in the story, character identification. It's even applicable when we read the scriptures. So we're going to look at Luke 24. We're going to begin in verse 1 and read through verse 12. If you have your Bible, open it up, please. If you, if you don't have the Bible physically in your hands, you could certainly use a virtual Bible. You can go to the YouTube, uh, I'm sorry, you, uh, version Bible app, or you could follow along with the screens with us, Luke 24. Now, before I dive into this, there's something we got to talk about. We have to talk about a central theme that we see in this passage. You see, in order to understand the characters that we're going to see in this particular chapter, we have to understand the central theme in this passage. That central theme is the miracle of the resurrection. The miracle of resurrection. This is actually the central event in all of Christianity. All of Christianity is pinned on this one central event, the resurrection, the miracle of the resurrection. I want to show you three things about the resurrection briefly here. Let's take a look at the first one. The first one is this. Jesus' resurrection is a declaration by God that he was perfectly righteous. Jesus was the one who knew no sin. He was the blameless, spotless Lamb of God. Look, if Jesus had not been righteous, then death would have chewed him up. Instead, Jesus spit out death. He is the one who is perfectly righteous. That's the first thing we see in the resurrection. The second thing we see is this. Through the resurrection, Jesus conquered death and sin. I mean, through Adam, 
in the Garden of Eden, sin entered the world. We call this the fall. We refer to that sin as original sin. And the consequence of original sin was death. So through Adam, we see sin and death enter the world. Well, through the resurrection, Jesus turned all of that upside down. He reversed it. And he took away the pain of death and sin for those who believe in him. So that's the second thing. The third thing is this. Those who are united with Christ will live the way that Christ lives. Listen, Jesus is alive. Though he, he perished physically in this world, he was raised to life once again. He's resurrected. And so those who trust in Christ, yes, even those who die in him, will live as he lives eternally. It's a powerful thing. You know, the resurrection, as I said, is the central event in Christianity. I mean, so all four gospel accounts have an eyewitness view of the resurrection from the grave of Jesus Christ. Not only that, churches meet on Sundays. Why do churches meet on Sundays? Well, because the scriptures tell us that Jesus came back to life on a Sunday. All of Christianity hangs on the resurrection. This is central to all of it. Yet, there have always been people who have doubted the resurrection. Perhaps you have your doubts about it, or you know someone who has their doubts about it. This is nothing new. Listen, we don't have photographs. We don't have videos on YouTube with footage of the resurrection. But what we do have are, again, eyewitness accounts. You see, Jesus appeared to people. God arranged it so that Jesus appeared to people. And those people were convinced of his reality, so much so that they told other people about him. And, and there were written accounts of those eyewitness viewings of the resurrected Jesus. Let me share with you just briefly one of these. This comes from the book of Acts chapter 10. I want to read to you verses 40 and 41. Listen to what the Bible says about Jesus and these accounts of him being resurrected. God raised him from the dead on the third day, as we're talking about, and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Do you hear that? People actually had fellowship. They shared meals with the resurrected Jesus. Jesus appeared to hundreds of people, not just one or two, hundreds of people after he, he was resurrected from the grave. At one point, Jesus appeared to 500 people, we read in the book of 1 Corinthians. So Jesus is resurrected. And this is central to all of it, the miracle of the resurrection. Jesus prophetic prediction encompassing both the suffering of rejection and death and the vindication of third day resurrection has been filled. This is the miracle of resurrection. Here's the question though. Will those who are Jesus's closest followers or even his faithful disciples perceive this miracle of resurrection that's where we pick up today in the scripture. So now we go to the gospel of Luke chapter 24. Once again, I encourage you, find yourself in the scripture. Let's pick up in verse one. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. You know, I think it's very appropriate and interesting that the miracle of resurrection was first made known to women. I mean, this is unthinkable in first century Palestine. Women were unfortunately of low status. Yet 
Here we have Jesus, and this is typical of him, announcing his resurrection. First, to women. Listen, Jesus is no respecter of persons. He does not conform to our social hierarchies or our prejudices. And I love that, and we see that reflected in this passage. There's a couple details here I want to point out to you. First of all, these women were carrying with them spices. These spices would have been used for the purposes of embalming a corpse. And so these women were on their way to to pay honor and respect to Jesus. This was perhaps their final tribute to to the one that they loved so dearly. And you can only imagine that as they walked along the road with their spices, they were probably wondering, how are we going to move that huge stone that's guarding the entrance of the tomb? Well, of course, they, they came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away. Now, all this tells us, the fact that they were surprised that the stone was rolled away, the fact that they were bringing these embalming spices with them, it tells us that clearly these women were expecting to encounter a dead Jesus. They expected to find a corpse in the tomb, but that's not what they found. And so the question is, well, why? If these are some of the friends of Jesus, some of his followers, why did they find themselves thinking they would find a corpse in the tomb? Well, I want to point out to you right now what I would call two uh, character identification points. Let's look at the first one, okay? The first one is this. Things didn't happen the way that the women anticipated. I mean, things just didn't happen the way that they thought they might happen. These women, as followers of Jesus, no doubt, believed that Jesus was going to enter into a kingdom. They most likely believed that. But they didn't anticipate the cross and the severity of the cross, the way in which Jesus died. They didn't anticipate the grave. And so for them, they were thrown off. All of these things that have happened the way they weren't expecting them to, caused them to have doubt. Well, how about you? Have the circumstances of your life, have have the circumstances of your marriage, or the things that have happened with your children, or the way that your career has unfolded, have those things impacted your faith? Have things not gone according to the plan, so to speak? Those kind of things can have a way of shaking up your faith. That's what happened, I believe, with these women. So that's the first character identification point. Here's the second one. The second one is this. They had lost sight of the promises of God. They had to be reminded by the two angels, the men in dazzling clothes who appeared to them. These women had to be reminded of what Jesus had said. They had lost sight of the promises of God. And why did that happen? Well, I believe it's because of the dramatic life circumstances that that had been thrown at them. I mean, think about it. These were tumultuous times in Jerusalem with the death of Jesus and and the earthquake and all the things that happened. They had lost sight in the midst of this of the promises of God. I mean, perhaps some of you have encountered the death of a loved one in your lifetime. And whether that is recent or or something that happened a long time ago, you've never been quite the same. You lost sight of the promises of God. It threw you off track. Or or maybe it's right now. What's happening immediately in the world? That this worldwide pandemic, the coronavirus, has thrown you off, and it's caused you to panic and doubt. Have you lost sight of the promises of God? Let me pose a question to you. I'll call this the character identification question. The question is this, have you forgotten the power of God? These women had forgotten the power of God. They expected to encounter a dead Jesus. Have you forgotten the power of God? Because of your circumstances, because things haven't gone according to plan, your plan, have you forgotten the power of Jesus? I wonder if you identify with these characters. I find myself sometimes identifying with them. Let's continue in the text. Let's look at Luke 24, verse 8. And they remembered his words. And returning to the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven 
and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. So now we have a new set of characters that are introduced to us. We've met the followers, the women of Jesus. Now we meet these disciples once again. These are the disciples of Jesus, the 11, now 11, faithful followers of Jesus. These are people who have witnessed the miracles of Christ. They have been hearers of powerful teaching, and yet they do not believe. They hear this report from the women, and they don't believe it. It's unbelievable. And you know, this actually reminds us of something. That you can be close to Jesus, but totally miss the heart or misunderstand the heart of his message. I mean, you could be a person who goes to church your entire life and yet may not fully know the power of Jesus. That's my story. I grew up in the church. I spent the first 19 years of my church going to Sunday school, going to church every Sunday, serving in the church, and yet... I had missed the gospel. I I had somehow misunderstood who Jesus was. That's what we see in these disciples. So close, yet so far away. And we have this really interesting detail. It says that when the women approached them and told them the report of Jesus and the empty tomb, it says that they considered it to be an idle tale. Well, the original language says that, that that means utter nonsense, When they heard this report from the women, they considered this to be utter nonsense. And and the verb tense indicates that this was an ongoing refusal to believe the women. They wouldn't hear it. They wouldn't believe what they had to say. Well, once again, I believe we have two character identification points I want to point out to you. Here's the first one. The miracle of the resurrection can be difficult for a person to believe. I mean... Here you have the followers of Jesus, people who have been around him, and yet they don't believe. The miracle of the resurrection can be difficult for a person to believe. And here's why. Bodily resurrection. Bodily resurrection is actually nonsense or absurd to the rational mind. Think about it. How many people do you know who have been raised from the dead other than those you read about in the Bible like Jesus and Lazarus? No one. And so this is something that intellectually, cognitively, It's hard to wrap our heads around. Well, how about you? Have you found it difficult to to believe in the miracle of the resurrection? What obstacles are you allowing to hinder you in believing in Jesus? I mean, could it be that your perception of what Christianity is is hindering you from believing in Jesus? I mean, what the media says the way that maybe you've encountered Christians, has that characterized what you believe about the Christian faith? Or maybe it's that you don't have answers to the questions that you have. Is there some sort of intellectual or cognitive block? The disciples here, I believe, had this. The miracle of resurrection was hard for even them to believe. I wonder if some of you are feeling that way. Here's the second character identification point that we see. It's this. That there is an enemy, and he wants to keep you from believing in the miracle of the resurrection. There's an enemy, and he wants you to to not believe in the miracle of resurrection. Satan, the devil, was clearly at work. He was kicking up dust with these disciples. I mean, think about it. Jesus says that the devil had asked him to, 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 he requested to sift Peter like wheat. We read in the scriptures that the devil entered Judas. That's two of the 12. How many others were dealing with this spiritual warfare? How many others were under the attack of the enemy? And I wonder if if some of you feel this way. Maybe you're wondering, how do I know if the enemy is keeping me from believing? Well, I'll give you two ways you might know. The first is this. Does this make you angry? I mean, as you hear the message of Jesus, as you... Think about coming to church, or if you hear about the Bible, or if someone talks to you about faith, is it something that makes you feel angry? Do you tense up? 
that could be a sign that the enemy is keeping you from believing in the miracle of salvation. Here's another way you might know. Um, if, if you find yourself unusually closed off to this beautiful message of life and hope, it could also be that the enemy is trying to keep you from believing in the miracles of the resurrection. If that's you, my prayer for you is that God would free you, that he would remove the obstacles, that he would defend your heart and your mind so that you would have the freedom to choose to believe in the miracle of the resurrection. So I have another character identification question for you, and it's this. Are you ignoring Jesus? I mean, these disciples, people very, very close to Jesus, were ignoring what had happened. They refused to believe it. Do you find yourself ignoring Jesus for intellectual reasons? For reasons maybe that you can't see, spiritual reasons. Perhaps today is the day for you to identify with these characters and recognize that there's an opportunity to think differently about him. There's an opportunity for you to turn towards Jesus and no longer ignore him, but to embrace him. You know, we see the disciples, we see the women who are followers of Jesus, and understanding and obedience are not their first responses. No, instead, we see that they're perplexed. We see that they are cynical. And you know what that tells us? It tells us this, Easter faith does not emerge immediately or easily. So we must be willing to truly ponder the miracle of the resurrection. We're not looking here for easy faith. I, I don't want you to have easy faith. Here's what I would ask you to do. Ponder. Ponder who Jesus is. Prayerfully consider the miracle of the resurrection. Investigate for yourself. Don't make it easy faith. These disciples, these early followers of Christ, certainly didn't have easy faith. They had to go through a process, and perhaps you do too. So I asked you at the beginning to, to consider who you might identify with. We talked about character identification. Who is it you identify with in this story? Is it the women? I mean, do you find yourself forgetting the promises of God? Do you find yourself forgetting the words of Jesus? Or do you find yourself like the disciples? Do you find yourself ignoring Jesus, turning him away? Well, listen, I don't know who you identify with, but I can tell you this with the utmost confidence. Jesus has identified with you. Jesus has identified with you. And you know how I know this? Let me read to you Philippians chapter 2. Starting in verse 5, check this out. Scripture says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. But taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, who is God, took on human form. He became a man. Not only did he become a man, and identify with us. He humbled himself. He humbled himself to the point of an excruciating death on the cross, a sacrificial death. And God has exalted him. God has resurrected this Jesus, raised him back to life. This is what we call the miracle of the resurrection. He is alive. Listen, Jesus has identified with you. The question is, will you identify with him? This scripture tells us how we can identify with him. It says it right at the end here. It says that with our tongues, we can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
It's a very simple way for us to identify with them, to articulate it, to say it. I want to share one last thing. We have to go back to Luke 24 and finish the passage we've been reading. I'm going to read you the last verse of the passage we're reading. Verse 12, Luke 24. It says, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. You see, Peter heard the report of the women. Those women who were surprised themselves to find that Jesus wasn't there. And Jesus heard the report like the rest of the disciples. But Jesus chose, I'm sorry, Peter chose not to ignore. Peter made a decision and he got up and ran to the tomb. And when he got there and he saw that there was no body, he marveled. He was amazed. He was stunned that Jesus was alive. You know, there's a decision for you to make here today as well. There's a decision for all of us to make. And that decision revolves around what we've been talking about here today. What do you believe about the miracle of resurrection? What do you believe about Jesus and his identity as Lord and Savior? It's a decision you have to make. You know, Easter faith is identifying with Jesus by believing in the miracle of the resurrection. That's what Easter faith is. Identifying with Jesus, believing in the miracle of the resurrection. You know, have you ever had a time in your life where you said, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he rose again. I believe in the miracle of the resurrection. I believe he paid for my sins. If you haven't, today is an opportunity for you to make that huge decision. That monumental decision. And here's what you can do. You can run to the tomb, so to speak. You can marvel at Jesus. That's something that we all can do. I mean, perhaps you're someone who through the circumstances of life, and through difficulty, have turned away. The doubt has crept in your mind. You've forgotten the promises of God. Look, you can recommit yourself to Jesus today. Easter faith is identifying with Jesus and believing in the miracle of the resurrection. And so, I want to give you an opportunity, a way that you today can practically run to Jesus and marvel at him. It's very simple. We've set up a text message service. And if you text the word miracle to 474747, there's going to be someone who's going to follow up with you with a phone call. And they're going to talk with you. They're going to pray with you. Look, we're not going to try to sell you anything. We're not asking you to give money. We simply want to be there to support you as you consider this major decision that Jesus is indeed the one, the Lord, the Savior, and that the resurrection is indeed a miracle, and it's a miracle for you and for me. Would you take the courage and take this opportunity to send that text, 474747, the key word is miracle, and when you do, follow up with the person who calls you and talk to them and express What it is that you want to say? Do you want to commit your life to Christ? Do you want to acknowledge that he is your Lord and Savior? Do you want to embrace the miracle of the resurrection? You can do that. Do you simply want to go back to God and say, God, I want to rededicate my life to you. You can do that as well. Or perhaps you simply need prayer. Whether you are watching this live or if you're watching it subsequent to Easter day, you can still send that text and you'll still get that call. Listen, my friends, there is no bigger decision. Jesus has identified with you. Have you identified with him? Perhaps you find yourself like the women in this text. Perhaps you find yourself like the men in this text. If you do, listen, the good news is this. They all came around. Though they didn't immediately believe and have faith, 
they considered Jesus. They pondered him. And they made a decision to turn to him in faith and embrace the miracle of the resurrection and to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. You can do that today too. Please pray with me. Oh God, thank you so much for the miracle, the resurrection. And God, as we come to you on this Easter day, we thank you for Jesus, who through his resurrection has forever defeated sin and death. Oh Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who has made a way for us to you, the Father. And Lord, as we look at Jesus, we come in different places. Some of us, Lord, come in a place where perhaps we have questions, we have doubts. Others have found themselves disappointed by life circumstances. Still others are intellectually struggling to wrap their head around the resurrection. Lord, whatever case we may find ourselves in today, I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us and call us by your grace to surrender our lives to Jesus, to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and to embrace the miracle of the resurrection. Even right now, in your home, in your kitchen, wherever you are, you can say to God, God, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. God, I believe in the miracle of the resurrection. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he died and he rose again. God, thank you for hearing our prayers. We trust in faith, Lord, that as you hear us, you're also eager to save and forgive. Thank you so much, God, for Jesus. It's only by his name and by his blood we can come before you. We thank you for the empty tomb, for the miracle of resurrection. And now, God, hear us as we continue in worship. We pray all this in the powerful, matchless, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.